Well, we're we're here doing it this way because we, we're on a reading plan as a church, and we uh, want to always line up our messages with our reading plan. But then we have moments like this morning yeah. where uh, we have Dr. Richard Ross here, and so in in order to not sort of skip anything, uh, we want to we want to continue to um, stay on task. Yeah. And so this is a message, sort of an an overview of the message we would have preached this Sunday morning that would have aligned with the previous week's reading. And right. so f- folks can listen to this or they can watch this and it will uh, uh, sort of highlight the reading they just came into. And and plus, um, we do have some community groups that are meeting this yeah. morning. And so this will help uh, them as they have their discussion about this morning's text. And this morning we find ourselves in Numbers chapter 13, and 14. And where we've been so far is last week we left the nation of Israel um, and they're at the, the foot of Mount um, uh, Sinai. Moses is at the top. He is having a conversation with God. And that conversation is pivotal because this is God engaging Moses to prepare Moses and the people for him to dwell with them. And yeah. in order for that to happen, the tabernacle is going to be constructed. They've already got the instructions for it. Um, and God is going to reveal his character to them so that as he dwells with him, they don't mess it up, mm. <laughs> that they know yeah. who God is, and they know how to approach God, and they know how to interact with God. And that's what God does with Moses. This is my character, and so he's preparing them for that. And so then that happens. The tabernacle is constructed, and the rest of uh, Exodus, uh, we see that con- that construction happening. And, and then we even see Moses and his interaction with the people. God is going to say something to Moses. Moses is going to come out and tell the people. His face is going to glow as evidence that God has spoken and that God is with them. And Moses is going to be this uh, mediator between the people of God and God. And then we get into Leviticus. And Leviticus, um, you've read, we read some of Leviticus, and we see Aaron. We see you know them working out as high priests and doing all this different, uh, their priestly duties in the tabernacle. But we're, what we're seeing is we're seeing the nation of Israel in Leviticus, this law expounding and going out, and the nation is becoming more organized. They're learning how to live amongst each other, relate with each other, and more importantly, relate with God. Mm-hmm. And Leviticus sort of shows them how to do that. Right. Um, and then we find ourselves in Numbers, and Numbers is is just that. It's, it's more organization. The first chapter is a census. How many people are here? Who are they? And it's just further organization. And, and what we're learning here is that God's preparing them for what he promised them. And what he promised them in the Abrahamic covenant, where we started at the beginning, mm. was that there's a land. Yeah. And in Numbers 13 and Numbers 14, we finally approach this land. They're prepared and they're ready to take it. But some things happen that's both tragic and um, also not surprising given the history of the nation of Israel. Yeah. And so we'll read uh, uh, the first few verses in, in, uh, in our text this morning. So. Yeah. So if you're, if you're listening in, in your car anywhere, you can just listen along. If you're where you can, you can grab your Bible. This is Numbers 13, starting in, in verse 17. It says, When Moses sent them to scout out the land of Canaan, he told them, Go up this way to the Negev, then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. Is the land that they live in good or bad? Are the cities they live in encampments or fortifications? Is this land fertile or unproductive? Are there trees in it or not? Be courageous. Bring back some fruit from the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and scouted the land in the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob near the entrance of Hamath. They went up through Negev and came back to Hebron, where Aimen and Shashai and Talmai and the descendants of Anak were living. Abron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. When they came to Eshkol Valley, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, which was carried on a pole by two men. They also took some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called Eshkol valley because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut there. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from scouting out the land. Man, there's, so what, what's the, the, the cool thing is, is they do, they do find this land and it says something about God, doesn't it? What does yeah. it say about God, Hunter? Yeah. So in, in, in this text, what we see that they, they finally approached the promised land. 
and it's everything God promised that it was going to be. And more, because yeah. who would have expected a great uh, one cluster of grapes to be needed to carry by two, two men? guys? I mean, it's yeah. like a whole a whole a whole vineyard is being yes. carried back to um, uh, the the people so that they could see God. God is telling the truth. He yeah. is holding up his end of the bargain. Yes, yeah, so he he told them that it was going to be a land flowing with milk and and honey, which which is is literal in some aspects, but it's it's much more poetic and figurative. Of it's going to be a land that is going to give you not just everything you need, but it is going to be milk and honey were extravagances. Right. The, the, it is going to be everything you could have wished for and more. And and this first report we see Moses sends the people out, and it's true. Yep. God has brought them to a land that is more amazing than they could have ever dreamed. And if you take that and you go back to what we taught last week, even even just sort of lay it on top of your reading, mm. God's character, everything he said about himself, this this sort of it, it validates that. Yeah. I mean, he is patient because he didn't he's given them this even though they built a golden calf. Right. Even though they had to receive in the the law twice, yeah. he had to renew it because they just keep being disobedient to him at, at every turn, and so he has held up his end of the bargain and more. And they go back and they report, "Hey, the land it is it is exactly the land yeah. he told us it would be." Well, and imagine that the people left Egypt to travel to this place. So the expectation, the the probably insecurity and fear of is this really going to be better than than yeah. where we're going? We've packed up our whole family. It's it's better than Egypt, but it, where where are we going? Will it be worth it? And so it's this God is vindicated yeah. in this moment of of His promises are true, yeah. and and the land is there and it's ready and it's what He promised it would be. Yeah, and one point, especially as we get into what happens next, they've been journeying to this land for a year. Yeah. So this is a this is roughly a year since they. Uh, left Egypt, right. and they've gone through a whole lot. And um, you would think that going through that whole lot, they would be sort of emboldened to to face whatever challenge is in front of them. Yeah. But we're going to find out uh, differently here. Yeah. So Numbers 13, 20, starting in verse 26. Yeah, so so they're told, uh, we, we see there at the beginning in, in 17, they're told to go see a couple of things. And one of those things was, who's there? So they're expecting that people will be there, but what, what will yep. they be like? And we're told that the men went back to Moses, Aaron, and the entire Israelite community in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back a report for them and the whole community, and they showed them the fruit of the land. They reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. And here are some of its fruits. However, the people living in the land are strong, and the cities are large and fortified. We also saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites. Are living in the land of the Negev. The Hethites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, Let's go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. But when those who had gone up with him responded, We can't attack the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative report to the Israelites about the land that they had scouted. The land we passed through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. And all of the people we saw are men of great size. We even saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we seem like grasshoppers, and we must have seemed the same to them. So these people are different. You, yeah. you can't read this passage and not see that what they came across was not just um, groups. Egyptian soldiers. Yes, th these are different people. Now, yeah. we're, we're going to talk a little more and expound a little more yes. on, say, like the Nephilim uh, uh, at, at, at the Sunday Night Podcast. Yeah. We're, gonna, we're bringing back the Sunday Night Podcast, yeah. and the Sunday Night Podcast is going to be more uh, expounding on our reading. Yeah. Maybe in-depth. Uh, yeah, kind of dealing with some of these issues weeds. we're not going to deal with. And, and there's certainly plenty of weeds to get into yeah. when you start getting into the debate of the inhabitants of this promise. Who yeah. are they? Are they actually humans? Are they... Are they demons, spirit? I mean, there's there's a lot of things out there to yep. uh, try to uh, have fun working through. So we'll yep. do that. But regardless, no one denies something's different about these people. Yeah. Because the the nation of Israel, when they see them, after everything they've seen, they get they're still scared. Yeah, and and they're scared because they have this unexpected opposition in front of them. Yeah. While inhabitants were probably a given. Yeah. Not like this. Not these. 
They, they were used to going in and being able to potentially, there were a lot of them. It, yeah. the, the Israelite, this is not a small group of people trying to go. So there's, there's a good level of confidence. If they're weak, malnourished, encampment, kind of just basically squatters, it's, hey, there's only so many of them. We'll just move in and they'll move out. Yeah. And what they saw was, we'll, we'll get into later, but regardless, after everything they've seen, mm-hmm. it was still enough to make these men afraid. Yeah which says something about how how th- these aren't people in tents. Th- mm. These are cities yeah. with intimidating people yeah. that they're going to have to go in and do something about if they want the promised land. It's clearly not the uh, – they, they did not expect this kind of opposition because no. that's, what, that's what these people are going to be. These people yes. are – the, uh, we get in our minds, they're just like groups of like sort of innocent people. It's breakfast, they're cooking eggs, and all of a sudden these people show up. Yeah. But these people, uh, these groups of people, these tribes, whatever we end up, uh, whatever we want to call them, um, they are there and they represent opposition. Yeah. And they're going to be, yeah. they're going to oppose the people of God because yes. that's what they're there for, yes. essentially. Th- those are people that, that we'll, get, we'll get into later, but even just the, the even using the words, uh, the people of Anak and Nephilim. These are people that are seen by Yahweh and his people as these are your enemy. These, right. these aren't just people that are where they're not supposed to be. Yep. They're here because they know what the land is and they don't want you to have it. And so they're like, oh, man, they're here. Yeah. They're here. And so there's a principle there. So this is historical, right? right. I mean, we, what we're reading is an account of a historical event. Yeah. The people of God are, are are at the banks of Cain and they're ready to take this promised land and they come across these people. But yeah. there is... There is a lesson for us as believers because the whole journey of the nation of Israel to this point, and even the aftermath here in just a moment, yeah. shows us something. And, and what it teaches us is it teaches us that we're not exempt from opposition yeah. on our journey to what God has promised us. Yeah. And we sort of live our lives sometimes thinking that, um, or being surprised when things don't go our way. Yeah. Like, it's, we're shocked. Like, I can't believe that would happen to me. Or, yeah. I'm doing all these good things. I'm obeying. I'm I'm walking, but but then all of a sudden, this opposition shows itself. Yeah. Well, and it's such a it's a clear picture of life. Even if you just wanted to make it, if you wanted to make this historical event almost completely an illustration of of just what, think of what the people of Israel have had to endure the yeah. last year. Yeah. Plagues. Yep. Captivity. Escape. Yeah. Which is uh, it, it, all all the kind of stressors that go with that. They saw God kill every firstborn in Egypt. Yep. They had to walk a lot. They went through the the shame and fear of creating an idol and then being chastised for that, but then they, being forgiven for that. They Moses is probably not the happiest with them at the moment, unless he is the most graceful man on the face of the planet. He went and talked to God, got the tablets, came back, had to go get another set. Mm-hmm. They've been communing with God. Their, their leaders have, have, have had dinner with the Lord. That they have gone through all kinds of, of great things, but it, it's been a hard season. Yeah. And then the moment that they feel like rest is here, it's another thing. Another thing. And I think even for us, that that feeling of of you know after after the pandemic and COVID, we we were talking about this a little bit earlier in the in the office about j- just the last couple of years and what what it's been like just living of after everything that happened with the pandemic. It's like, okay, finally, that's starting to calm down. Now we get a break, right? No, Russia invades Ukraine. And now the whole world is is spending on another issue. So it's just that it, there's always another, and that's the Christian life. Until we get to the other side of eternity, there is always another thing yeah. that we're going to have to deal with and that we're going to have to go through. There's always going to be another unexpected opposition around every corner. Yeah. And that's what we were promised. We yeah. weren't we weren't sold a bill of goods that it was going to be easy. Yeah. We were told that it was going to be a journey of, of taking up our cross. And and theologically, um, the world is still broken. Yeah. Um, there's opposition, not just that's coming from the realities of a broken world, yeah. but um, they're still they're still agents of opposition that yes. are trying to stop the movement of God. Yeah. And we don't need to forget that because the moment we forget that, when that opposition comes, it, it rocks you and it can move you in a direction. And that's what happens with the nation of Israel. Yes. They see this opposition and their response to this opposition matters because when we're faced with opposition, we have a choice. Mm-hmm. And it's a choice that um, the same, essentially the same thing the nation of Israel is faced with. So they see it, they're, they're, they, they, they recognize it, but what are you going to do about it? Yeah. They're there. 
what happens. So yeah. the next text shows us what their response is yeah. to this unexpected opposition. So they've gotten these two reports. Caleb says, let's go. Let's take it. We can do it. Look at what God's brought us through. The others say, there's no way. And so how, do, how, does, the cra- how does the congregation essentially respond? It says, then the whole community broke into loud cries and people wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint another leader and go back to Egypt. Another leader to go back to Egypt. Imagine being Moses. Yeah. You, you've been through chaos and suffering and faithfulness. You, you have, and it's, and it's known. He's not crazy. They know he's been talking to Yahweh. And he led them out of Egypt, led them out of captivity. He's brought them to the land. And their response is, nope, let's get another one and let's go back to slavery. Fe- yeah. Fear totally overcomes and it's what fear does. It's it's so irrational. What's the rational thing to do here, Pastor? Like the, you follow the guy that literally led you out of captivity and brought you to the place where God told you you were going to be. But because well, of their fear, they yeah. reject him. So you have you have two options. One, you've got um, you choose faith or you choose fear. Yeah. And really, in this account in verse thirty, then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, let's go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. Mm. Caleb is the picture of faith. Yeah. Now, it doesn't give us insight or, or, implicit, or explicit sort of uh, motivations right. here. I mean, we're assuming that Caleb has this response because he's seen what all God has done. He's yeah. like, no, we can take it because yeah. listen to all this other stuff that's happened. Yeah. So he represents faith, and faith is moving forward. That's what faith does. Faith moves forward, and it's not blind. No. I mean, moving into that land to, to battle these folks is not a blind act of faith. No. It's rooted, and it, there's tangible evidence that they are going to go and win because, one, God promised them the land, yeah. and at every turn he's shown them how powerful he is. He yeah. destroyed the gods of Egypt. Yep. Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, right? I mean, he he he's done everything that they need in order to go in and to be bold and to possess that land. But instead, they respond with, "We cannot do it. Yeah, we can't do it." And and more than we can't do it, like, wouldn't the logical choice here be, let's just go to find another piece of land that's maybe a hundred miles to the east? But that's not what they they, they want to go back to Egypt. Yeah. They want to go back to captivity. They don't want to go find freedom at another spot or another house. They want to go back to the thing that enslaved them. Yep. And that's what fear does. Mm. So the moment you become afraid to do what God has asked you to do, that you know God wants you to do, you get fearful. And what you do at that point is naturally, it may not happen immediately, but naturally you begin to fall back into your flesh. Yeah. Because you're leaving the very things that God has set up for you to give yourself over to. Yeah. And so fear moves you backwards. Faith moves you forwards. Mm. And this is what the nation mm. of Israel does, is instead of choosing faith, they choose fear. And at this point, this is when God is like, okay, guys, yeah. are we serious right now? Yeah. And this, of course, this is my word. This is the remix version yeah. of, of numbers, but... Um, are y'all ser- you're seriously not mm. going to go into the land? Yeah. I mean you're you're going to you're going to retreat. You would rather go back to Egypt. Yeah. than to take this land that one is flowing with milk and honey. Yeah. And that I've promised you and I've also built this promise and and done this in such a way that I've I've shown you at every turn my power and my might. Yeah. my 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 authority. And you think that these giant people here you don't think you could take them? Yeah. Or, or or you don't think I can take yeah, them? Yeah, through you. Yeah. And so they they start getting fearful. Yeah. And then God does something, which gives us another principle, another reality. of The nation of Israel is a story of disobedience yeah. and consequences to that disobedience. But this is going to be a, a really big one because at, yeah. this, at this point, their disobedience has been met with grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, Moses pleaded with God at one point, and God's yeah. like, okay, here's what we'll do then. Yeah. But now... God's had enough. Yeah. Right. And the text tells us um, in 14, starting in verse 26. Yeah. There's been, there's been so much patience and, 
and the Lord comes down and he, and he reinforces something he says back in 11, but it's the same kind of idea that the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, how long must I endure this evil community? And that keeps complaining about me. I've heard the Israelites complaints they make against me. Tell them as I live, this is the Lord's declaration. I will do to you exactly as I heard you say, your corpses will fall in this wilderness. All of you who are registered in the census, the entire number of you 20 years or more, because you have complained about me. I swear that none of you will enter the land I promised to settle you in, except Caleb, son of Japana, and Joshua, son of Nun. I will bring your children whom you said would be, become plunder into the land you rejected, and they will enjoy it. But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness. So unexpected opposition on their journey yeah. to the promised land. They respond with fearful retreat, and the consequence is corpses fall. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's also something uh, in there that's really important, too, is, is God is still just. Caleb, who showed faith, he gets to see it. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the bulk of them, 20, or really all of them, yeah. 20 and older, don't get to see it. No. So they're for the next 39 years. So they're in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah. They've already been in it for a year. Now, for the next 39 years, they're going to wander in the wilderness and corpses are going to fall yeah. to the point that that whole generation is not going to get to see this land yeah. that was already reported yeah. to them is a great land. And that's the tragedy. Yeah. It, it's not even necessarily that they die. It's that they die not getting to see the promise come to full fruition. It, it's such a it's such an immature response by the people of Israel. It's almost like the the, the kid that... You know, d- doesn't get the exact toy and the exact color of the phone with the the exact. And they said, we we might as well not even have Christmas. And God's response is essentially, okay, yeah. no no more. You you get to decide your your fate. You yeah. said that you should have just died here. That you should have gone back to. I will give you exactly yeah. what you seem to want so badly, yeah. and stay you will here. not. Yeah, stay here, die. Your kids will get to enjoy it, mm-hmm. but the, the, this is the last straw, which which shows a couple of that, that there is a. Um, the Lord is long suffering, definitely. But there is an end mm. to His just allowing you to continue doing what you want to do before He hands you over to it, which we see throughout the entire biblical testimony. Yeah, I heard somebody. It might have been a, it might have been Matt Chandler. I heard him say once that um, one of the scariest things is God allowing you to have what you want. Yeah, like here, I'll I'll I'll, I'll just give you. I'll let you have what you're asking for. Yeah. You know, I remember how he said it. He said it way better than I did, but this is essentially what it is. He's like, okay, you know, you're, yeah. you're too scared. You just stay here yeah. and, and you're going to be here until you die. Yeah. Well, and there's so many things to get, but the, the response is so weird. They, they don't ask God to, to take the people out. Mm-hmm. They don't ask God to move that they, they, they are, their response is not, we still want the land. What do we have to pray to get the land? Even if they're scared to fight them, it's, no, never mind. Let's just go back. I don't want it. Which is their mo? Because yeah. they do this not long after they leave Exodus yep. too, or, or, or uh, Egypt. Yeah, um, they're like, we we need to go back. Yep. And then God shows them, you don't need to go back. Yeah. You're thirsty. Here's something to drink. You're yeah. hungry. Here's something to eat. You can't see. Here's some fire. Yeah. You don't know where you're going because you can't see the stars during the day. Well, here's a pillar of of of, of smoke. Here's a cloud to guide you. And here they find themselves again, forgetting all that, mm. fearfully wanting to retreat. And then God says, okay. Not going to happen. Your disobedience, your lack of faith, I'm, I'm done with it, which shows us that even amongst God's people, there are consequences yeah. to our disobedience, yeah. and those consequences are just. And this is a reminder for me that um, that when when my sin, when, when I choose fear and not faith, and the results are um, uh, not results that I would want to have in yeah. my life, it's because of me. I yeah. made that decision, and it's not God doing this to me. But I made that decision, and that's the principle here is that there are consequences to our disobedience. Yeah. And then there is joy in mm-hmm. our obedience. Yeah. And it doesn't mean obeying God is easy because the journey as they obey is yeah. hard. Well, and the, the, the thing that's about to happen, we're, we're about to enter the conquest narrative in right. Joshua. Caleb getting to see the promised land is not just a waiting game. It is a intense, violent yep. battle yep. to get what was promised. Yep. Um. But, but, but Pastor, as we, as we kind of wrap up, so, so we see God keeps his promises, that there's unexpected opposition, that, you know, we have this decision to make between fear and faith whenever we respond to that unexpected opposition, and that there are consequences and blessing to either obeying or disobeying. 
what what do you want our community groups talking about this morning? What, what do we take from this story? How, how do we apply this to our life? What kind of conversations would you want to see in our groups this morning? I think the conversations are centered around obedience, but an obedience that's rooted in what God has done for you. Mm. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. This is not an obedience um, just hoping. Yeah. It's an Our obedience is grounded in something. Yeah. There's tangible evidence in our own lives that God has shown us that obeying him is always the right thing. Yeah. And it's the one thing that on the other side of that obedience that is what brings us joy. Yeah. Jesus and when Paul describes Jesus's crucifixion, he he makes this um uh, statement about Christ, and he he tell he tells us that that Christ went to the cross, and for the joy set before him, mm. he endured it. Yeah. Well, that phrase is really it's 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 he knew what was beyond his obedience. Yeah. He knew what was beyond his fulfilling of that mission. And I think as believers, we need to always keep in mind in front of us what's beyond. Mm. That in our obedience, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it may be, keep in mind that obeying God is always the right thing. We'll yeah. never regret it. And we can trust God that on the other side of our obedience, what awaits us is exactly what he promised us. Yeah. And that yeah. he is not lying and that everything he said to us is true. Glory is at the yeah. end of this road. And in our path of, of to glory and obedience, as things get di- difficult, the answer is always to obey. Yeah. There are moments in our life when we retreat, right? So now we're not Old Testament believers. We're mm. New Testament Christians. And so now when we do have those moments, that's where grace comes in. That's yeah. when Jesus comes in. And that's when we're reminded of of um, uh, being saved. And so um, uh, we can choose faith over fear yeah. if we if we keep our eyes on, on the Lord yeah. and remember what he's done for us. Maybe an encouraging thing for our groups to do this morning or if you're listening for you, for you to do is to share with, with your group a time in your life whenever whenever you made – this, this decision, either positive or negative, and, and what happened, that, that you remembered the Lord's faithfulness mm-hmm. and, and what the Lord has done for you that makes trusting him easy. I think that's what I'm always impressed by with, with older saints is that faith seems to come not, not easier, but it's more natural because they just keep, they'll say, well, well he was with me when, mm-hmm. and you know, th- those of us that are younger that might only have a handful of, of, of really impactful moments. They've got decades of look, look at what the Lord has done, and and that's what God says that that kind of angers him. It's not these people aren't obeying me, and I'm God, which He could perfectly well do. Sure. He says these people aren't obeying me, and look at what all I've done for yeah. them. So maybe this morning, whenever you talk about uh, obedience from what God has done for you, sh- share some stories um, about how the Lord has been faithful to you in in your own times of of being in the wilderness. Absolutely, it's a good word, and there's so many lessons to be learned from the nation of mm-hmm. Israel and. I pray this was helpful uh, to you guys this morning. So God bless, and we will see you soon.